Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is wonderful to be back to this ever-growing Singapore FinTech Festival. Over the last decade, as the UN Special Advocate, I have really witnessed a rapid improvement in financial inclusion. Today, almost 70% of all adults have a financial account. That is an increase of 1.2 billion adults in the last eight years. Financial inclusion matters because of its power to improve people's lives. It is not an end in itself, rather a means to create jobs, take part in an increasingly digital economy, hedge risks, improve development outcomes, empower women, and enhance the financial health of, our, of customers. During my last UN visit to Dhaka this July, I met Izu Hassan. In 2016, Isu started to produce her own grandmother's hair oil recipe to sell to neighbors and friends. It was an immediate hit. However, to commercialize her home-based micro-business, she needed support. With the help of a local fintech, ShopUp, not only was she, was she able to quickly access credit based on a digital footprint, but ShopUp also supported ISU with back office and online administration. Today, ISU has a booming business, employing four people, and she has bought a house for her parents. I am convinced that inclusive technology innovations like ShopUp present today a best opportunity to tackle financial exclusion. There are currently 1.7 billion adults still unbanked, and many more do have access, but not to products that meet their needs. Therefore, they do not use them. We have come a long way since mobile phones were first used to leapfrog brick and mortar bank branches and rethink traditional business models for serving the poor. Kenya has been one of the global uh, showcases of this. Mobile money providers and the central bank drove the rapid increase in the number of banked adults from 42% in 2011 to 82% in 2017, a huge increase. They have succeeded in digitizing domestic remittances, broadening access to digital accounts, introducing proportionality to know your customer requirements, creating test and learn regulatory approaches, and building and closing agent networks. This has resulted in real improvements in citizens' lives. In 2016, MIT study found that access to mobile money allowed 10% of the poorest households in Kenya to pull themselves out of poverty. There are today now 272 active mobile money deployments across 90 countries serving almost 900 million registered users, which is great. However, usage of these services is still very low. Two out of every three mobile money accounts are inactive or dormant. And the active use of savings and borrowing is stagnant. This basically says something about the quality of these products. Now, FinTech is beginning to show it can reverse its trends. New competitors are emerging with startups creating more tailored, faster, and cheaper products. And mobile money product providers and banks are striking partnerships with innovators to better serve these users. Yet, one big challenge is to have regulatory tools which can keep up with a fast pace of innovations and new risks. These new risks include cyber attacks, privacy breaches, dominating super platforms, and discrimination that could be created by algorithms. In terms of exclusion due to algorithms, an American fintech uses customers' punctuation and spelling in their credit scoring models as a proxy for quality of education. Well, spelling mistakes is not necessarily an indication of someone's ability to pay their bills. And I don't need to tell you what this weekend actually came up 
about the latest news of algorithms offering less credit to women, even they actually had better scaring, uh, credit scoring. And last year in India, cyber hackers infected Cosmo Bank's server with malware and retrieved customer personal information, and they stole $13.5 million. Another big risk, big risk is that a rapid expansion of digital credit to the underserved can lead to indebtedness and further exclusion due to lower credit scores. From the third of Kenyans that have recently used digital credit providers, about half of these have been late in repaying their loans. Subsequently, more than 400,000 borrowers have been reported to the Kenyan Credit Reference Bureau for late repayment on astounding lo loans of less than $2. So building these regulatory tools is especially challenging for countries who lack resources and the staff with the necessary skills to understand fintech's rapid development. Based on the early experience of regulators, my fintech working group has issued a report earlier this year together with the Cambridge University with the support of MASS. This report contains early lessons learned on regulatory sandboxes, innovation offices, and reg tech to help regulators, especially from developing and emerging markets. Three key insights from the report are, first, regulatory sandboxes are not always the right tool to begin with. Less resource intense innovation offices may be a better starting point. A recent assessment by the Kenyan Capital Market Authority revealed that an innovation office was enough to resolve regulatory questions of most startups. Second, some initiatives are more suited to the initial stages of regulatory innovations, while others can benefit from existing initiatives and infrastructure. Mass's experience with their innovation office gave them a good foundation to create afterwards their regulatory sandbox and explore regtech solutions. Third, facilitating interagency coordination and collaboration is crucial. Many innovative financial services cut across several regulatory, man regulatory mandates. Intra-agency coordination is often needed to make regulatory innovations effective. For example, to provide innovators with a single voice, the Dutch Central Bank and financial market authorities jointly run an off innovation office today. So while improving the regulatory environment is a crucial piece of the puzzle, the private sector is really key. It is the private sector that will develop customer-centric approaches and create products which will improve users' actual financial health and not simply create access or usage. Providers and investors can also create industry standards to make their practices more inclusive and safer. Fintech associations can lead by providing a collective voice to regulators on policy changes to encourage innovation. And large companies can also support the emergence of new solutions and startups by establishing fintech hubs, accelerators, and anchoring industry sandboxes. More broadly, if we want fintech to thrive, there are necessary policies and pieces of infrastructure that need to be there. Some are critical for access, such as connectivity, physical infrastructure, and digital IDs. Others make markets work better for customers, such as fair competition and interoperable payment systems. And some others to protect the finance system and users, and users such as data privacy, cybersecurity, consumer protection, and digital and financial literacy. To deal with all of this, we need to share knowledge among different countries. We can learn from Mexico, which has established an interoperable payment system, or from Peru, with its new digital ID systems, or India. 
and organizations such as the BIS, Gates Foundation, MASS, and the World Bank Group can facilitate knowledge sharing on global public goods among central banks. Finally, I call on each of you to consider the large impact that you can actually have on financial inclusion. You can co-create products, standards, regulatory tools, and public goods so that FinTech can seize its potential to spur inclusion and improve people's lives. Remember, still 1.7 billion people to go in terms of access, but many, many more where you can actually improve their financial lives to actually make their dreams come true so they can actually become resilient and actually build for a better future. I wish you a lot of success and thank you very much for all your endeavors. Thank you.